You might find bugs in a feature tour, but not because you're hunting for bugs. That's not what a tour is about. Tours help you understand the product, what it has, what it does, what people want from it. If you put too much time and attention to bugs, at this point, you're being distracted from the tour. Later, after you've done the tour, then you can walk through your list of stuff. Your list of features, your list of error messages, your list of some other kind of stuff. Once you have the list, then you can test the stuff, one little stuff thing at a time. Touring illustrates coverage-driven testing. Make a big list of stuff and then test down the list. At any time, you can count coverage in terms of the percentage of features you've tested. Of course, a better measure of coverage would be the percentage of features you've tested well. Tours are often done at one time by one person, but they don't have to be. Touring is like any other form of exploration. There's nothing wrong with taking a break, and two people often see more than one, more creatively and more clearly. Feature tours are just one type of tour. Remember what I said a few minutes ago about this being a survey course? that we cover a scrillion topics in almost no time? Well, hold on to your seat because we're about to look at 22 types of tours. You can tour the user interface looking for features using a menu and windows tour or a mouse and keyboard tour. Instead of looking for isolated commands, you can look for transactions. Transactions are complete tasks. You can look for error messages. You can look for variables. You can look for the program's data or for samples of data that come with the program. You can look at the files that make up the program or that hold the data the program will use. More generally, you can ask, what are all the things that come as part of this product? In state model-based testing, you identify all the program states. You can do a tour for externally visible states. These are what are called the operational modes. Then you design a set of tests that check each transition from one state to the next. So for example, suppose you start at state A. And from A, you could go directly to B, to C, or to D. Suppose from B, you could go back to A, or on to E, or to F. Well, in state model-based testing, you'd include tests for all the state transitions, from A to B, from A to C, from A to D, and from B, from B to A, from B to E, and from B to F. Most state model-based test suites make sure they cover all the possible transitions from one state to another but they don't intentionally cover all the longer sequences, such as a two-transition sequence from A to B and then from B to E. A sequence tour looks for interesting sequences through the program. Now, some people talk about sequence-based testing as a type of state model-based testing. But that's not quite what I have in mind here. There are some sequences that a person would do on purpose. The person does a series of steps with a goal of achieving a certain result. That's what I'm thinking about here. For example, in the tour, you might find yourself at a certain state in the program, and you might ask, what do I want to do next? To do that, where would I have to go in the program, and what are the ways for me to get from here to there? Each way is a sequence. The distinction that I'm drawing between sequences and state transitions might remind you of the distinction I drew between transactions and functions. Sequences and transactions are more based on how a person thinks about the program and what she wants to do with it. State transitions and functions are more about individual elements of the program. Along with looking at the specific things that make up the program, you can hunt for all the claims that people make about the program. What's it supposed to contain? What's it supposed to do? This is a foundation for specification-driven testing. To understand the benefits the program is designed to provide or will be expected to provide, you might have to go beyond the program and work with competing programs or read textbooks or product reviews. Tours aren't limited to the code you have to test. They're about teaching you about the code you have to test. A market context tour uses many of the same sources of information as a benefits tour, but to help you understand the place of your product within its market. What products could people use instead of yours? Why would they use them? Why would they use yours? What makes your product special? Some testers don't think that marketing information is relevant to their work, but when a company sells a product, there has to be a reason for a customer to buy it. Marketing folks use the term unique selling proposition to refer to the special characteristics of a product that will make people want to choose it. Understanding your product's differentiators and those of your competitors can help you prioritize your tests, help you select interesting test data, and help you make powerful arguments that certain bugs must be fixed or they'll have a market impact. By the way, 
Even for products that your company develops for in-house use, there's still a market context. The people who use your programs will compare them to the other programs that they already know. If your program is inferior, those users will eventually rebel. Now consider users. Most products are built for many different users who have different needs and expect different benefits. Where would you look to figure out who the users will be? The concept of a life history of an object is a bit abstract, and we're going to see it again, so I'll spend a little time on it in this slide. The life history of an object starts when you create it. It continues as you use and transform it, and it ends when you terminate it. For example, imagine a phone system. You pick up the phone and make a call. So the system that calls an object, it's a combination of data and capabilities. The system takes the phone number data, creates messages to another computer. That computer controls phone somewhere else and it establishes a connection between your phone and the phone you called. When you hang up, the phone call's terminated. It's gone. The object no longer exists in the system. For that phone system, you could try to list all the objects the system can create and how they can be created. They can be created in different ways. For example, someone might create a phone call from outside by calling you. It's still a phone call object, but it's got created a different way. You could then list the ways each object can be used, changed over time, and how and when they can be terminated. You might get much of the information you need for this analysis from phone system standards, or by reading specifications of this particular system, or just by trying things with the system and seeing what happens. To do this kind of analysis, it helps me make diagrams or outlines of what the system can do with its objects. I make one diagram for each type of object. Then I walk through them with one or more of the programmers. Explaining them helps me understand the meanings of the diagrams and see new possibilities. And the programmers point out a lot of misunderstandings. Here's another example. The slide mentions checking accounts. So imagine going to a bank and opening a checking account and recording it in Quicken, which tracks your financial records. To Quicken, a checking account is just a new kind of object. You can create it, do things with it, change its attributes, and of course, eventually you're going to close it. But does closing the account end its existence in Quicken? Well, in one sense, yes. Can't write any more checks on it. But you can print reports that show the history of activity in the account. So is the object really gone, or is it just in a different state? Ultimately, the end of life of an object is an ambiguous concept. That ambiguity itself is interesting, and sometimes it can lead to bugs. In the configuration tour, you find out what you can configure. What settings can you change in the program? What settings can you change in the operating system? As you discover the variety of possible configurations, you test for the effects. How does this setting affect the program's ability to get that task done? Testing interoperability means asking how well the program under test works with other programs. Compatibility testing is like interoperability, except that I say compatibility to refer to how well the program works with devices, like printers and video cards, instead of programs. But these aren't rigid distinctions. Some people use the words compatibility and interoperability to mean exactly the same thing. You do a testability tour to find out what makes the software easier or harder to test. Testability tours usually generate design requests instead of bug reports. The idea is to do the tour early so that you can influence what testability features are designed into the software. A risk catalog is a list of ways you think the software under test could fail. Touring the program for failure modes is one way to gather input for the risk catalog. We'll talk about this more in the lecture on risk-based testing. The variable tour asks what variables the program has and how it uses them. The extreme value tour focuses on each variable one at a time. It asks what values of this variable might be troublesome or high risk. Now, in the typical extreme value tour, you try the potentially troublesome values. And as you gain an impression of the program's vulnerability to extremes or different types of special cases, you gain a foundation for systematically checking all the variables for these types of problems. You won't have time to check every variable for every risk, but you can make time for checking the risks that you know the program is likely to have trouble with.